Back in the 1970s, a troubled, to say the least, high school student ended up kidnapping a child and ending his life, doing unmentionable things to him in the process. The controversy due to this case has continued all the way up into the present era. Back in 1975, a five-year-old boy named Jason Foreman was out playing with his brothers and sisters, along with a bunch of other kids from the neighborhood, on a nice sunny afternoon when he disappeared. His mother heard him talking and laughing through the window at around 3.30 in the afternoon. Little did she know that would be the last time she would ever hear from him. It was May 8th in 1975. Toward the end of that day, Jason was playing with some brothers and a few of his friends. They moved over to a small bit of woods where they had built a fort and started throwing rocks at each other. Eventually, they moved off to a small parking lot near the end of Jason's street. He shouted to the other boys that he was going home and ran off to a fire station just down the road. He lived about 30 yards up the hill from that fire station, but he never made it home despite the close proximity of his house. Those around him would go on to explain that he vanished on a perfect summer day. This day also happened to be the 25th birthday of his mother, Joyce Foreman. Jason's uncle, a military man named Peter Schofield, was stationed at Fort Dix back in 1975 when he was suddenly called back home to help search for Jason. He got a phone call the next morning, his wife saying that the FBI was on their property. He asked why, and she explained the circumstances. His home had been searched inside and out, given that he lived on the same street as Jason. With permission, he was transferred back to South Kingstown and served two weeks under a detective as they searched for Jason. Jason's older sister, Raven Aubin, was 10 years old when Jason vanished. She never imagined how long she would have to wait to finally find out what happened to her brother and where he actually was. The truth would tear her and her family apart. On their street lived a then 16-year-old boy named Michael Woodmansey. He attended Rhode Island's South Kingston High School, where he was known as being a shy, loner, heavy-set kid who mainly carried a satchel full of books as his only company. Unbeknownst to the people around him, Michael had been grappling with violent thoughts for quite some time now. He had often wondered what it would really be like to kill someone. He thought it would be easy to do, that it would be easy to get away with, and above all, he thought that it would be fun. He lived with his father in a grungy, dirty, kind of nasty two-story house about two-thirds of the way to Jason's home on the opposite side of the street. Michael was sitting out on the cement steps leading up into his living room when Jason happened to stop by. Michael was sitting out on the cement steps leading up to his home when Jason happened to walk by on his way home. Michael remembered his previous thoughts. The killing, the fun, the ease of it all. He decided that he couldn't hold back any longer and that this was the perfect time to act out his fantasies. He shouted to Jason, calling him over, asking him to help him out with something. He then lured Jason into his home, promising that he only needed a hand for just a second. But then, abruptly, he grabbed a kitchen knife and stabbed the boy in the heart. For about an hour, he didn't really know what to do. He kept checking to make sure that Jason was really dead. Eventually, he was thoroughly convinced and placed the body into a large plastic bag. He then took it down to the basement of the home. He debated on what to do and decided upon burying the body under the foundation of his house. However, easier said than done as the basement floor was concrete. Instead, he just wrapped the body in a rug and threw it into a trunk. After cooling down a bit, he later returned to the body. It was at this point that the crime reached truly gruesome standards, and to this day, we don't know the full extent of what happened. He cleaned the bones, boiling them in a solution that would leave nothing left but the bones themselves. He then stored them all, including the skull, in a dresser in his bedroom. When his father later asked about them, Michael told them they were merely props for a play that he had been auditioning for. And, in reality, he did audition for a local play in which he played, ironically, a murder suspect. He then watched, from the close proximity of his home, for years and years as Jason's parents searched the neighborhood for any trace of him. Michael's father himself was actually asked to search his home for the missing boy. 
but he never made the connection and failed to uncover his son's grisly crime. The search went on for years and years. In that time, Jason's father became an alcoholic. His mother fell into depression. They both suffered horrible mood swings that Raven was forced to endure. This would continue for eight long years until, eventually, Michael was brought in and questioned for a different crime. On April 15, 1982, Michael, now much older and sporting a beard, tried to perform a crime similar to the one that he had gotten away with so many years before. A 14-year-old paperboy named Dale Sherman came to his house, and Michael made an excuse to lure him in. He offered the boy a drink, which he had spiked with alcohol until eventually the boy passed out. Sherman awoke to find Michael hovering over him, attempting to strangle him with a red bandana. The boy managed to break free. After Michael failed in his attempt, the boy broke out of the house and raced home. He recounted the story to his dad, who was understandably enraged. He went straight over to Michael's home and punched him square in the face. At some point, the Sherman family called the police over to their home. Michael's father, none the wiser, called an officer over to his home to complain about someone punching his son in the face. The officer humbly suggested that they both come down to the station and talk about it. Michael was soon taken in for interrogation regarding the attack on the Sherman kid. Michael calmly admitted when being interviewed that he often fantasized about murder. He told them about how fun and easy it seemed to be. When recounting both this and the details of the crime, two officers had the same gut reaction. That this guy might have been involved with Jason Foreman's disappearance all those years earlier. And it didn't take much questioning to get Michael to admit to his involvement. Shortly after, he confessed to both violating and killing Jason all those years ago. The details of the horrific incident would soon gradually leak out to the public with some of the most disturbing details coming to light, including the disgusting fact that Michael had eaten portions of the body. He told the police that, upon searching his room at his house, they would find a journal. He assured them, however, that everything in this journal was false, purely fiction, nothing more. This immediately gave them the suspicion that whatever they would find in that journal would be, on the contrary, very true. It turned out to be a small booklet, only several pages in length. Everything was written into neat little paragraphs. Obviously, a lot of thought was put into it. Only a handful of people would ever even go on to be able to read this journal. They were very tight-lipped on about what exactly that journal contained. They would only say that it was a horrible, horrible crime and that it was the worst thing that all of these cops had seen in their combined years of service. In addition to the parts about the consumption, there were other details that, to this day, the police have never been comfortable releasing. The victim's father was only told by some investigators that Michael explained in detail how he had stripped the bones and, yes, eaten portions of what he removed. Not only did the police find the journal, but they soon found the bones as well. The skull was on top of the dresser, and many of the other bones were still inside a sizable box on top. They were all completely clean and shellacked, meaning that they had been covered with a type of resin similar to varnish called shellac. The father of the victim, John Foreman, said that the police didn't show him the journal, but did give him a good idea of what it entailed. And this was enough to scar him for life. Jason's sister, Raven, was privy to a lot of the information that the police never revealed to the public. When describing the scene, she said, Inside were my brother's shellacked bones, his arms, legs, a small jaw, a few spine and rib bones, and finally his skull. The bones were washed and finished for display. Michael coveted them. He treated my brother's bones like trophies. Next to the box was the disgusting journal. This deranged killer murdered my baby brother, and as he watched him die, he scribbled notes in a journal. It was a how-to book on murder. This knowledge has understandably affected her very deeply up until the present day. The journal itself has been legally sealed and protected by the courts. Some claim it has been destroyed. Some claim that only the original was destroyed and copies exist. Its current existence is unclear. 
Jason's family was relieved to finally find out where he was, not knowing that their son had been right across the street for all of those years. When hearing the news, all they could really do was cry. In the minds of the public, Michael Woodmansey was a sick, twisted individual that would most likely never spend a day outside of prison for the rest of his life. But, well, you saw the thumbnail. Michael finally pled guilty to second-degree murder back in 1983. As the result of a plea bargain, he was eventually sentenced to 40 years in prison. The prosecutor negotiated the whole plea bargain as an effort to avoid having to go over the gruesome details about the murder during the trial. Granted, he was sent to jail, but it meant that the more horrific details of the crime were never proven in court. Years down the road, a problem gradually surfaced. In Rhode Island, there was something called the Good Time Law. This made it so that a prisoner could get around 10 days off of their sentence every single month if they remained on good behavior. In the 28 years that Michael was in prison, he was able to cut 12 years off of his sentence because of this law. Because he held a job while he was in prison, he was actually able to earn 12 days off his sentence for each month that he was incarcerated. Because of that, in 2011, he was set to soon be released. Understandably, the news threw salt into the still-open wounds of Jason's family. They were forced to relive the entire tragedy all over again as the killer was set to walk free once again, simply because he didn't screw up anymore while in prison. Michael dismembered my brother limb by limb, said his sister. Soon after, he was eating my brother's flesh, like the animal he was. No, he was worse than an animal. Animals kill to eat, to suit a need. Michael killed purely for sport. Michael killed just because he could. She felt that Michael should remain in prison indefinitely, particularly because of the bizarre and outlandish violent nature of the crimes. She couldn't imagine that someone who could kill someone in such a horrific way could ever just go free again, let alone so soon. She feared that he would kill again, that the same thing would just happen to someone else. And she wasn't alone. Many people in the community didn't want him back on the streets. Many actually threatened to take justice into their own hands if he was released. A lot of people fought to keep Michael behind bars, but in the end, it was the law. There wasn't a lot they could do. When it came to Jason's father, however, he didn't particularly care about the law. When interviewed by a local radio channel about the killer's release, he said, I do intend, if this man is released anywhere in my vicinity, or if I can find him after the fact, I do intend to kill this man. Even the Superior Court judge, Susan E. McGuirl, who was the prosecutor that agreed to the original plea bargain itself, was shocked by the news of Michael's pending release. Eventually, due to all the outrage, it was ordered that Michael Woodmansey be evaluated by two different independent forensic psychiatrists to see if he fit the criteria to be committed involuntarily. Using the journals, whether it means descriptions of them, copies of them, or the supposedly destroyed original is unclear. Rhode Island prosecutors and prison officials argued that they strongly believed he should be put into a mental hospital immediately upon release. After a bit of time, Michael and his legal counsel came to the agreement that he would voluntarily commit himself to the Eleanor Slater Hospital indefinitely. Michael Woodmansey was officially released from prison on September 11th in 2011, after serving only 28 years of his already short 40-year sentence. Well, short given what he did, anyway. He quickly went to the previously decided upon mental institution. A year later, legislation was soon drafted up in order to change the early release laws that nearly let Michael walk the streets again as a free man in hopes that something like this wouldn't happen again. If it did, they might not luck into a criminal agreeing to enter into a mental hospital willingly. Hell, it was extremely lucky that it worked out that way in the first time. However, these changes would likely be pretty expensive. It costs a lot more to keep an inmate in jail than to release them under periodic supervision. Many officers felt that it would not be implemented just due to this reason alone. However, eventually the legislation was signed on and approved, meaning that violent criminals would no longer receive the 10 days a month off their sentence for good behavior. Once again, thank you for watching this video. Uh, it would be a little messed up if I asked if you enjoyed it, but if you found it interesting, uh, please leave a like, that really helps, and subscribe if you want to see more stories like this.
If you want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account, which I always link in the description below, and speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. Tang, Sash Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Jewel G, Wafranz, Callahan, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, Winnicott, David McLaughlin, Marsh, Buffazerk, Lonro, Jewel Mavchan, Kim Peak, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Main, Jackie, Trace Ferguson, and Mark Barnett. You guys are the best. I almost passed out after reading that in one breath. Thank you. Good night.